So you've picked up from me that in my life in Glasgow, I, it's kind of twofold. I teach half-time at a theological college that comes out of Manchester, England. It's part of the University of Manchester, but we have the Scottish branch, and I'm in charge of all the Scottish students. But then our ministry with Upper Room Church, it's called, for all refugees, there's about 300 in our church now that are uh, Muslim background people made up of people coming from Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria, and now, of course, more and more Ukrainians, although you, Ukrainians wouldn't necessarily come to us because it's in Persian language, Farsi, English translated to Farsi, and also to Arabic. So it's quite a challenge. When I give a talk there, I have to think it's going to be at least three times as long because it has to be translated twice. And <laughs> I'm not known for brevity anyway. <laughs> Although here I do pretty well, so I've, I've learned along the way. And so to get started this morning, I want to introduce to you one of our new young men in the past year. His name, you see, is Karzan Karimi. He is Kurdish Iraqi, Kurdish Iraqi, and he is 16 years old. Why a 16-year-old kid all by himself, a refugee in Glasgow, Scotland? When he first attended the upper room about one year ago, I asked him through a Kurdish speaking translator why he had ended up in Glasgow and he said, I need an entirely new life. I need a whole new life. And that leads us beautifully into my hope this morning to share with you some thoughts from John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 38 to 46, that have become hugely important for our work in the Upper Room Church generally, for people whose only experience of God is religion that is deadening far from giving life. So turn to it in your Bibles now, John 11, 38 to 46. I love this passage because it is not in the form of a theological argument. It is not in the form of a propositional doctrine, but it is in the form of what I like to call a Jesus drama. It speaks to people who have any sort of artistic inclination, which is really all people, but some more than others. A Jesus drama. Jesus teaching us the most profound truths through the most dramatic of moments in real life and death situations. Teaching that comes through drama that is real and true and historical as well. And so I love this passage because I want to suggest to you that it is a drama enacting Jesus, the one who actually commands life. He commands it to come about. Life. So let's read these verses right now. This is the amazing account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Life and death. But let's pick up at verse 38. Use your own Bible, but you can look at my version if it's helpful. We can note here in verses 38 to 46 the crux of it. Jesus, therefore, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
But I knew that you always hear me. Nevertheless, because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Out came the man who had died, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. We can note that the final verses in this miracle account, verses 41 to 46, easily arrange under the headings of the prayer of Jesus, the command of Jesus, and the reactions to Jesus. Today, I simply want to look at the command of Jesus in verses 43 to 44. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out, out came the man who had died bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Biblical scholars have debated why John, the writer of this gospel, particularly mentions that when Jesus summoned forth Lazarus, he particularly did so in a loud voice. In idiomatic Koine Greek, it would have been certainly understood as a shout. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And most agree that it is particularly a loud voice in order to echo as though resounding down across the corridors of all history God's own voice, verbal decrees in Genesis 1 wherein we read over and over and over again that God simply said and life erupted. Correlations between John's gospel and the opening chapters of Genesis are all through John's writing. It echoes this shout that produces life. God said. Jesus speaks loudly and forcefully here so as to echo the command of God that assuredly promotes life. Life erupts here in John 11. In fact, life is restored here. In fact, life is what? Resurrected here. Christ himself is the source of real life, real living. In fact, he's identifying his identity with the creator God himself from Genesis chapter 1. Because the new living provided for Lazarus, keep this in mind, the new living provided for Lazarus was not in the hereafter. It was not life after death. It was life for now in the ongoing earthly life that Lazarus would be now enabled to continue. And then he would have to die a second time because of his humanity. It is at Jesus' command that you can have life now. Doesn't wait until post mortem experience for believers in Jesus. I love one well known Bible scholar who is really acclaimed as an expert in John's Gospel, puts it beautifully this way. He says, The authority of Jesus is so great that had he not specified Lazarus, all the tombs would have given up their dead. <laughs> for resurrection life. Jesus had to say, Lazarus, come out, or every tomb. <laughs> That's the authority of Jesus to bring life out of deadness. It is deliberately and provocatively in John's vernacular choices the language of command of one with life and death authority, like a military order or better yet, a creational order, so that it is not Jesus commending life, it is Jesus commanding life. Come out! You want real 
life, real living? Seek it from the author of life, Jesus, the creator God, the Trinitarian relationship. Concomitant with this, but highlighted particularly by Jesus himself, is the reality that Jesus' command is also a calling out. That is literally, according to the original language, what he says when Jesus shouts aloud in verse 43. Even though many versions translate it as Lazarus come forth, it is most literally Lazarus come out. Lazare duro exo. Come out, Lazarus. And what is Jesus' command calling Lazarus out of? Well, of course, out of death. He is dead and decaying in a tomb. And this is why John includes this very graphic and provocative language of Martha, the sister of the deceased. In verse 39, Martha, the sister, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. That's quite graphic language, isn't it? My brother stinketh. <laughs> John wants it to be understood that this guy is truly, exceedingly, totally dead. Four days. Stinking in a tomb. Described so by his very own sister. Who loved him, we know from earlier in John 11. But it is not just a call out of being dead. Rather, in John's symbolic and metaphorical way, it is a calling out that is more than that. It is certainly that, but it is also a call out of deadness. It is, in fact, a call out of all that is deadening. All that a completely dark and dank tomb evokes in your mind and in your soul and in your emotions where life has turned. Even for living people, it can turn into decay and death-like existence. Perhaps this is what young 16-year-old Karzan was hinting at. I need a whole new life. My life has been full of deadness. This grand miracle, you see, is a reminder that Jesus himself calls you and me out of all that is deadening rather than life-giving. One chapter earlier, Jesus is the one who said, I came that they might have life and life abundantly. Jesus calls you and me out of all that death represents, eternally, yes, but also right now. Existence that might be thought of as death-like. Perhaps that was why Karzan was a refugee. You want that? Only Jesus Christ can give you that. And simply at the command of his voice, Ben, come out. Eli, come out. Sarah, Hannah, Joshua, come out of all that is dead. But, it is even more extensive than that because the metaphor in this account is also clearly alluding to how Jesus also frees us from even the trappings of death and sin. Trappings is an English way of referring to the outward signs, the features or objects associated with something in particular, and in this case, things associated with death. And the biblical reason that death intrudes into our experience at all, which is sin. 
This is why, of course, John describes the scene for us so graphically in verse 44. He who had died came out, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Quite a compelling picture, isn't it? Being bound up with the trappings, the result of death, literally in Lazarus' case, and as a result of generally sin in the world that is the underlying reason for death. The trappings of deadness, not just being dead literally. The whole point of Jesus' miracle here is to tell us and to show us that his purpose is to set us free from these things. And so don't you love the conclusion? Jesus simply says, unbind him. Let him go. He shouldn't be entrapped with all these paraphernalia of death. He has a whole new life. Unbind him. Today, I sat where you are many years at Cheney. And even in 15, 16, 17 years of life, you can end up quite bound up with the trappings of sin, trappings of death, trappings of that which is not about life. And I urge you, Jesus wants you to be free. Whatever that means for you this summer, through your counselors, your teachers, your friendships here, hear the voice of Jesus to you. I want to unbind you and let you go. Ah, but did you notice one last thing? Seemingly such a small detail, but oh so important. How John, the writer of this gospel, adds a very significant note when he describes Lazarus coming out of the tomb. This is how he emphasizes it. Out came the man whom had died, who had died, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Why does John want us to know that level of detail? He simply say he is bound in death clothing, but he specifies around his face is a cloth because it would be picturing Lazarus stumbling around because he would not be able to see. message to us even today is plain and clear. Trappings of sin and death cause us to stumble around, to get hurt and hurt others because they render us spiritually blind. When you are spiritually blind, you hurt yourself, but you also hurt others. It is a symbol, a metaphor again, of how sin and death cause spiritual blindness. John's writing is full of such metaphor, such symbolic language. Of course, it's literally true in Lazarus' case, but it's also a message, a metaphor, a symbol for you and for me. Jesus commands, unbind him, let him go. It includes the freedom to see again. Do you want that? Only Jesus can command it. Jesus doesn't just commend it, he commands it. Unbind him. Let him go. Free you from spiritual blindness.
And so we come back to my young friend Karzan. His photo was taken when he was only 16 years old. A few months ago, he had his 17th birthday. Some of you are 16, 17. Can you imagine yourself growing up Kurdish, Iraqi, and finding yourself in a strange place like Glasgow, Scotland, all on your own? He had nobody. Why? And the reason he was seeking a whole new life was his old life was entirely filled with decay and deadness and ugliness. He was being forced in his wee Kurdish Iraqi village he was being forced into same-sex relationships with very old men in retaliation towards his family because they were Kurdish and because they were seen to be not strict enough Muslims. And his parents pleaded with him to allow them to pay a smuggler and get him out of such deadness. And that's how he ended up in Glasgow. But here's the next chapter in Karzan's story. Just about six months ago, Karzan came forward and knelt at an invitation I gave. And he gave his life to Jesus. Just last week, just Thursday before I left to come here, when I saw him just before the Upper Room Church gathering, I asked him how he was doing. And again, with a Kurdish-speaking translator, he said to me with a huge smile on his face, I really have a whole new life. I have a whole new family. I have brothers and sisters. A new life. What a miracle drama in which Jesus commands life itself. Jesus calls you out of all that is deadening. Jesus frees you from the very trappings of sin and the culture of death and deadness, Jesus opens your eyes to see, fully see with spiritual vision again. Karzan, like many, they really don't know the nomenclature, so they call me father. <coughs> They've heard that term in, you know, more liturgical settings than we are. <laughs> and I kind of used to resist that and explain, no, I'm not really, but now I claim it. I'm so proud to be his father, to help this guy grow in a new life. He, he smiles like that all the time. And yet he's all alone, waiting for an interview with the Home Office that will determine whether his claim for asylum will give him a visa and he can make a future. Jesus commands life. Do you have that life? Let's just pray together. Thank you, Lord, for dear Karzan. Amazing. And what a privilege it is to touch his life with the truth of Jesus. Invite him into a new family, a new life. 
pray for each student today as they go through the rigors of practice in chamber groups and master classes. Pray for Sarita and Graham as they rehearse and share their artistry with us tonight. And in it all, we would express the joy of life that comes from you. That our work would be an expression of the life Christ commands. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Join me today at 4 o'clock if you're free. I'll tell lots of stories.